It is Friday, August 27th. Let's talk PlayStation. Welcome back, everyone. As per usual, let us start with our PlayStation Plus reminder. The August games are still available, and they will be until September 6th, actually, because that first Tuesday is not until the 7th, so you still got a lot of time to grab these, but get it done if you haven't just yet. And for our first story, let's talk about Gamescom 2021, because this is where we finally got confirmation of a rumor and a sentiment that a lot of us felt for a while, which is that Horizon is probably going to be delayed into 2022, and that is indeed what happened. So it is confirmed the game is launching, well, we did get a release date, it's launching February 18th, 2022, but that is a delay of possibly, uh, what, two, three months? Because again, we've said it before, but it's August right now. We still didn't have a release date. If it was going to launch on time, then presumably we were looking at the fourth quarter of this year. So if it was coming out in, say, November or December, and now we know the game is launching in February, that's what? Again, a two, three month delay. It's not the worst thing in the world. It's just that now you have a lot of software to look forward to in that first quarter. And it's not that there's not a lot to play this coming holiday season, but more so uh, that was one of Sony's, uh, presumably one of their big finishers, right? I mean, you had that, and then we've got some other software that we're going to be talking about in a second. However, uh, we do have some bonus news about this delay, which is that the first game, Horizon Zero Dawn, was finally patched on PlayStation 5, or it's a PS4 game, but it was patched. So if you're playing on PS5 through backwards compatibility, that frame rate cap is gone. You can now play it at glorious 60 frames per second on PS5. And jumping in uh, for a little bit, it looks fantastic. It plays buttery smooth. And so much like we saw for Ghost of Tsushima or Days Gone uh, or The Last of Us Part II, um, it's great to have all these games finally getting updated. And so if you haven't played the game since launch, haven't jumped in for the patch with the New Game Plus trophies or the Frozen Wilds, which was offered part of the Plate Home Initiative, so you might have grabbed that without having paid for the DLC previously, which is the category that I fall into, uh, now is probably a good time to check out the game again, and it plays really good. Now, we also finally got some footage of Aloy in Genshin Impact, so if you're playing this game and you're looking forward to this, September 1st, you can see how she looks, and having not played the game myself, so clearly what opinion do I really have on this, but I think she looks quite good. Uh, I think she translates well to wherever you really put her, because um, we saw her in Fortnite before, and now um, she looks great here as well. So if you're into Genshin Impact, you're playing on PlayStation September 1st. If you want to play as Aloy on other platforms, you'll have to wait a little bit longer, but September 1st, PlayStation platforms, you can play as Aloy in Genshin Impact. Now, also as part of Gamescom 2021, we did get a new trailer for Death Stranding Director's Cut, and in typical Kojima fashion, it's an eight minute long trailer detailing all the new additions to this version of the game. So uh, there's a lot here that we'll unpack. Uh, first off, there's new delivery support items like we saw before, but they revealed the thrusters. These allow you to safely jump off higher ledges and areas and having played the game, I can tell you that would be very useful. There's also a catapult, which you can shoot your cargo across the map. I think it didn't look like it went that far. The buddy bot will carry your cargo or you for that matter. Again, not sure how useful that one will be. Then there's the firing range in the basement of all the facilities. I think it would be all the facilities. Now this will be a great way to experiment more with the gunplay, which is far and few between really in the base game. And also there's new weapons too, so don't forget that. There's also leaderboards when you're replaying bosses. There's new tracks in the music player and also new action-based delivery missions. So we can see this as an opportunity, again, to use more of the stealth, more of the gunplay. And there's some sort of story arc happening for these new facilities as well. So this is probably going to be where most of the new content is when it comes to single-player missions. Then there's tricks for the bikes, which is sort of cool, I guess. And then, like we saw before, there's racing as well, which... It looks slow, and you know I remember when making deliveries after building out a road um, in my single player run, or I guess asynchronous, right? So sometimes the roads are built, sometimes they're not, but when you finish them and start doing deliveries on those roads, it's not really, you don't feel like you're going fast. Um, but either way, there's a lot of content here, at least on the surface, uh, but I will caution still. I put 100 hours into the game, I loved it, but looking at what you know, looking at what's here, I mean, if you didn't like the game before, I don't think this would change it for you. Um, because honestly, a lot of the stuff is directly addressing some of the complaints with what was, you know, lacking in the in the main game, right? People thought there was going to be more gunplay, more stealth sequences, which they're there. And you can certainly engage with that stuff if you want to. But it's also easier to kind of avoid it or just go around camps and stuff like that. So um, it's great if you maybe started the game, enjoyed it, but then put it down, jump into this. And if you never liked the game before, then I would say there's probably not enough here to really change that. Uh, but until the game comes out, I mean, I guess the jury is um, still up in the air. 
Next up for Gamescom, we got more release dates for what would be considered uh, probably higher profile console exclusives on PS4 and PS5 like Sifu. This one's launching February 22nd, 2022. And if you remember, this was delayed last month into early next year, so it didn't take long to find out that it's launching a mere four days after Horizon Forbidden West, which is a bit close, but still, this is one game where there's a lot of eyes on it. I think it looks great. Uh, beautiful art style, really into the gameplay where it looks fast, responsive and fluid which i hope the gameplay is uh the way it's being presented i hope that's how it feels but that's one where you want to watch out for it february 22nd so shortly after horizon and then also this year another high profile game jet the far shore this was a game that sony uh showcased i believe alongside the ps5 initial hardware reveal or the september event but this title is coming out october 5th this year so not everything has been moved over to 2022 this is one where uh, previews are coming out right now for it and it sounds a little bit hit or miss depending on uh, how much you enjoy exploration or having to deal with certain enemies that pop up in this game so it sounds like the controls and actually navigating with the ship and exploring that's the fun part but then possibly when you run into enemies and having to avoid them or dealing with them it sort of breaks up the gameplay loop that's at least how it's sounding right now but um that game is coming out relatively soon october 5th so uh, that's one where you might want to um, keep your eyes on that once reviews start rolling in now, and some not so good news, but also completely expected, PS4 exclusive Wild, which if you remember was announced during Gamescom 2014, so we're looking at like seven years ago now at this point, which that was the Rayman creator Michelle Ancel's game, and he was doing that alongside Rayman, or not Rayman, Beyond Good and Evil 2, so both projects at this point have largely become vaporware, uh, more so Beyond Good and Evil 2, because that was uh, on the back burner even longer, and it had a, a new reveal trailer, but still, that game is... It's been MIA for a long time, next to Wild, and Michelle Ancel also retired like two years ago, so we kind of assumed this game was probably done, and that is indeed what we're hearing from Games Beat reporter Jeff Grubb during his Grub Snacks Giant Bomb show last week, where he says, uh, yeah, the project basically got shut down, and that team is trying to figure out what else they're going to do or work on something new entirely, but essentially, yeah, that project's done for, which... For the last seven years, obviously something went wrong there and it was um, either teetering away slowly, uh, got completely rebooted or or whatever. But if you remember, the, uh, the premise of that game was quite interesting where you're really interacting with the environment and uh, taking control of animals and there was this weird uh, tree lady. It was an interesting game that I think a lot of people really uh, were looking forward to at the time. But Vaporware, it's uh, probably not coming out at all anymore, which is not all too surprising given the circumstance. For our next news story, come September 9th, The Tourist is finally launching on PS4 and PS5. And what's noteworthy about this game is that as far as I know, and somebody can correct me if wrong, but this uh, may very well be our first PlayStation 5 game that actually utilizes some form of 8K resolution, which is insane to hear. And if you bought a PS5, it's very prominently listed on that box because by technicality if the system is capable of it in some way shape or form they can slap it on there and of course that's exactly what they're going to do uh, but the tourist uh, is, might be one of our few isolated examples of this game reaching a well not a true 8k resolution but uh, the PS5 uh, performance settings for this game is 4K 120 or 8K super sampling at 60 frames per second. Now, of course, the gameplay that I'm showing you, The Tourist, is not exactly a visually uh, demanding game by any stretch, but it is quite beautiful, picturesque, bright, vivid, uh, a lot of bright colors, and it kind of reminds me of 3D Dot Game Heroes on PS3 just by the the kind of design that they're going for there. Not exactly the same, but I think you know what I mean there. Uh, but hey, I hear it's quite good. So this game's coming out very soon. And if you do have an 8K television, you might be able to finally enjoy some form of 8K content, but still not really because it's super sampled to 4K. So that applies to all 0.1% of you, I'm, I'm guessing. I don't know if you have one, raise your hand. Uh, let's be friends. Now, moving on to our next story, as I'm sure a lot of you probably saw this because uh, there's a lot of eyes on this trailer, but there was the recent debut trailer for Spider-Man No Way Home, and it's an awesome trailer, but towards the end of it, we can see that there is a kind of weird, out-of-nowhere ad placement for not just PlayStation 5 as a gaming console, but the DualSense wireless controller. You can see 
just as a hard cut, it goes to the dual sense with the cosmic red up front and then the midnight black and the standard white in the back. Uh, this is part of that Sony initiative where all the divisions are kind of collaborating with one another. And while this is the one trailer where a lot of people saw it, so I think that's why most people are kind of going like, oh, that was sort of weird, right? Uh, but I think Sony also already did this for one or two other movies. Uh, I know Ghostbusters was one of them as well, where they just stuck in the DualSense ad towards the end there. Uh, but we also saw the official PlayStation Twitter account tweet out the trailer for uh, No Way Home as well. And that seems a little bit more appropriate, just given that, you know, a lot of people play the Spider-Man games and they want to, you know, see the new movie. But yeah, I think we're going to see more of this stuff happening, which it just, for, I guess, the movie trailer, it seemed so out of place. But why not advertise, like, the console or like a quick cut to like the Spider-Man game and the box art, like I, <laughs> at least it wasn't completely out of place, but it was certainly where you just kind of go, oh, all right, you know what I mean? But uh, anyway, moving on to our next news story, the first PS5 model revisions are finally out in the wild, first spotted in Australia and now the UK and probably, they'll probably be released globally at this point, but it's model CFI 1100A and B, so both the digital and the disc console or disc and digital is how that would be ordered and the two big changes here are the consoles are slightly lighter so about 300 grams lighter and also the screw that's supplied for the stand if you go for a vertical orientation you can now thread that in by hand instead of having to do it by uh, by using a screwdriver or something else that's you know within close proximity which is how I did it I just use a, a pair of tweezers to screw it in but now you can screw it in all the way just by your hand very simple it's not the most exciting first model revision of PS5, but it's the one that we have so far for the console's first year on the market. Next up, we've got a patent filed by Sony Interactive Entertainment back in May and recently published August 19th, and it's for a kind of like a dynamic PlayStation Store page and also a game page for whatever you have installed on your PS5's home screen, presumably. The full patent description, or the title rather, says video game page providing information and functionalities based on video game lifecycle and user context. So essentially, an ever-evolving store page that will change depending on where that point, where the game is in its life cycle on the market, if it's got a lot of DLC or something, or you know, this is probably gonna benefit live service games. Uh, what's really interesting is that if you look at the patent images, there is a very clearly an Xbox One being illustrated in these pictures. And there's also references to achievements and not trophies, which is really weird given that prior Sony patents, they almost always use a rough sketch and outline of a fat PS3 or an original PS4. They'll almost always use those two and nothing else. But here we've got an original Xbox One, which is really, <laughs> really a bit strange, but this is very clearly for the PS5's UI because you can see there's a lot of PS5 UI elements like the play game button and then below it you can see activity cards and also the three little dot dot dots which is always like the more options button essentially on the PS store or in your um, or in your lineup of games and things like that. So this would be, a, I guess, a follow-up to what is already a little bit dynamic on PS5 because those cards do change based on where you are in the game. And uh, again, this would probably work out better for live service games where they're always evolving and changing, like if there's seasonal updates or a lot of content coming out on a rolling basis. If that's what they're trying to explore, then it's probably for that, I would imagine. Moving on to our next story, as part of a recent interview with Game Informer, the PlayStation Studios head Herman Hulst had this to say regarding Japanese development and the you know the point of contention when it comes to Sony's commitment to Japan. Uh, his initial paraphrased answer here is that they're very much a Japanese company and that they're still focused on Japanese development. But to elaborate further, his uh, full quote here, he says, we're building out Team Asobi under Nicholas Duche, so we're actually investing in that team. People forget sometimes that we have Polyphony Digital, which is a team in two locations. We're investing in our external development group out of Tokyo as well, and that's a team that has obviously worked with the likes of From Software and Kojima Productions. So we are very invested in Japanese development, and Japanese development is something that we love. I think it's such a core part of the PlayStation identity that I can't ever see a shy away from Japanese or even Asian development. Now, it seems pretty clear at this point that Sony's still trying to address this in what looks like a direct way, which partly that's what they're doing. Uh, the problem here is that we knew about the reinvestment in Team Asobi, and that's good. I'm all for it. I'm sure a lot of you are. Uh, we know Polyphony is not going anywhere. It's still this uh, kind of, you know, the angle that people are looking at here is what about, you know, formerly what we knew of Japan Studio, the original development. You know, games like Last Guardian, Gravity Rush, Rain, Puppeteer, you know, what about those titles, which they're not really talking about and just sort of, you know, side skirting that under the rug and talking about all this other investment, which to their credit, it is investment. So we are seeing more uh, out of Team Asobi. 
and they are investing more in the external development group, which we sort of assumed they weren't going anywhere because that was the one department that um, has paid dividends for Sony throughout the years with uh, all those collaborative, highly profitable, and successful AAA games. So yeah, there's going to be more of that, but also XDev is now a, a global operation. So there's Japan, Europe, also probably some stuff in the U.S. happening now as well when it comes to XDev. So that's that's all great. Um, it's just that there's still not that you know they're still not really talking about I think what was the sore spot for many. But either way, uh, there is still there is still investment in Japan in some way, shape, or form, and I can't wait to see what that ends up looking like throughout the entirety of the PS5 life cycle. Now, in that same interview, Herman Hulst also acknowledged the uh, risk taking that happens with PlayStation Studios and how that's still a core part of their DNA, where he says, and I quote here, I encourage our teams to be fiercely daring in their choices, and they are, but it also means that I have to back them. I think that our teams have been really brave, and that's not just with entire franchise pivots, but it's also going into Norse mythology on God of War, it's The Last of Us Part II's narrative structure and creating an experience that is incredibly compelling but not necessarily comfortable for the player at all times. I back that. I want us to push the envelope and seek the boundaries of our medium and the state-of-the-art storytelling. I think that is why we do what we do with PlayStation. And you know what, I can, I can get down with this quote. I mean, right now, it seems like there's still a fair amount of negativity surrounding the, the PlayStation business or Herman Hulst even, which keep in mind, he took the job in late 2019 managing Worldwide Studios. And it's not like, you know, games take four or five years sometimes to come out. It's not like we can really see how he's managed that portfolio just yet. And what he's saying are still core tenets of the PlayStation DNA, which dates back to when PS Studios was formed in 2005, actually. Um, and a lot of those games started to come out around the midpoint of the PS3 life cycle. So we're talking 10 plus years of, you know, a focus on AAA single player experiences, which Sony was applauded for those at the height of the popularity of all these live service and multiplayer focused games. And I can certainly see the fatigue setting in for some people when it comes to like, okay, it's all these big budget single player games. And sometimes they can look a little samey because they're open world, you know, light RPG elements. And look, I, I hear you. If that's not what you're into right now, that's fine. Um, at least right now, or at least the prospects of what's coming uh, from PlayStation Studios, we can see that there's a, a very healthy spread. We've got you know these collaborations with uh, Haven, Firewalk, Deviation. Those are all multiplayer projects. Insomniac and Naughty Dog have multiplayer projects. Santa Monica's finally doing a new IP alongside God of War. Last of Us 2 may not have been your thing. Uh, Destruction All-Stars may not have been your thing, but we had Ratchet and Clank. Team Asobi's getting investment. Uh, Returnal, which is a, a larger budget roguelite. I mean, I think there's a pretty healthy, a very good variety right now that we're seeing. And it just seems there's a lot more to be optimistic or excited about versus, you know, what we saw in prior generations. Uh, I think it's looking good right now. Could still end up bad. You know, we could have a lot of worst case scenarios like studio closures and games coming out and not being received well. Um, you know, external projects that go south or, or whatever. The worst of the worst could happen, but I'm not really seeing that as a possibility for a lot of these games. So we will talk about this on year two, year three, and year four of PS5 once we have a better idea of what that portfolio really ends up looking like. For our next news story, I found this one pretty interesting. So John Burton, the founder of TT Games, which that developer best known for the, the Lego franchise games, all those uh, titles that have been released throughout the years. He left very recently, I think within the last year or so. Um, but lately, John has been uploading videos to his Coding Secrets YouTube channel where he talks about, you know, industry experience and things he's done throughout the years and answering questions. I always love this sort of stuff. I can watch it all day, every day. And uh, this past week, or somewhat recently, I think it was actually older, he had to re-upload this, but it was a video about Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart and how Sony's marketing was kind of misleading, saying how, and they did say this on one or two occasions. I think the creative director said this and then, I don't know if it was in any of Sony's like direct marketing materials, but essentially how the game would not be possible without the SSD on PlayStation 5, which, you know, John uh, made a short like six minute video explaining, you know, why there's a lot of classic development tricks in that game. And if you do play it, you can see what he's talking about there, where there's a lot of uh, sort of forced sequences so the game kind of knows what assets to load in. It's very predictable. And so even though it's very quick and the SSD is being leveraged to its advantage, it's still inherently uh, the sort of tricks that were used for the last you know, 20 or so years uh, with the uh, the advent of CD-ROM, right? When it comes to disc playback and things not loading on the fly, like these are the things that have been used for a very long time. And 
He also talks about some of the pocket dimensions where when you open those dimensions, you know, you're, you're walking towards them, the game knows to load in certain assets and the, the pocket dimension is very simple in nature with just some crates and, you know, sort of an empty skybox. And uh, he didn't talk about Blizzard Prime, which that's the one level that's a bit more aggressive with the um, sort of crazy asset flipping. So, and I think that's why he re-uploaded that video and I didn't catch the original one. But either way, he sort of talks about how it's kind of misleading, but he was uh, very purposeful in his wording saying that it was Ratchet and Clank gameplay and yes, the SSD was still being uh, greatly utilized to Insomniac's advantage and they're still a great developer and this and that. And here's the thing, I've never been a fan of when platform holders say stuff like this because then a few years later they go around and they take those games and ship them on the outgoing platforms or lesser platforms and you know sony has done this with like weird stuff too like Resogun. at one point they said that game cannot go anywhere and sure enough it went to ps3 and vita with enough visual compromises because that's the caveat is that you can do that and all of a sudden those games can be shipped somewhere else i mean switch is a great example of this today where it sees a lot of releases like the witcher or crisis and it may not be the best way to play those games, but by and large, if you make compromises, you can get it to ship somewhere else. And, you know, this is why uh, it's what I like to call consoles being uh, closed boxes and it's a matter of resource management. You know, they can be greatly optimized, but at the same time, you have to know there's a budget that you have to work with and many developers often will like throughout most generations will take a hit to frame rate. Uh, they would take a hit to frame rate and resolution to increase graphical fidelity. Uh, the caveat to Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart is that, uh, yeah, there is obviously a lot going on when it comes to very fast asset switching and loading and, Bla and Blizzard Prime is that one level where again, it's very aggressive with the assets changing. So I'm not quite sure how feasible that would be with visual compromises, but that is the thing. With enough drawbacks, I mean, certainly you could probably get that game anywhere if you wanted to, but but again, uh, the SSDs this time around provide an incredible amount of overhead. And I mean that for every SSD. I mean, even PS5, super fast one, that's great. But um, the argument has always been, it's great that every console shipping now has an SSD or, you know, the main units, right? Series S, X, PS5. Um, and of course, PC and Switch are, are a different beast entirely. But when it comes to third party uh, developers, it's great that that's the baseline. And this is also, I think, why I'm pretty sure we did a video about this, how uh, it was like before PS5 came out, which is that yes, SSDs are great to have and it will change game design at some point down the road, but you may not even really notice it because we're talking about 20 plus years of developers using the same tricks uh, in game development and that stuff might not easily go away. In fact, it may even still be baked right into most games because there is an incredible amount of overhead to stream in high quality assets. So for Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, you can make a case that, hey, we can ship this on PS4 or 3, but I think you would be uh, um, taking a, a pretty big hit to performance and visuals, even more so than what's expected on a PS4 or a PS3, right? And I think that's kind of the advantage to what a PS5 or a Series X can do right now, is that you're gonna be able to do, uh, you're, you've got a lot of breathing room when making your games, and you may not have to employ, you may not have to lean so much on those development tricks or employing, you know, long loading screens or what have you. Uh, but at the same time, don't, you know, got, go out of your way and say this can't be done on so and so or, or whatever. That, that wording always doesn't really fly well with people, but still, it was an interesting video and something I wanted to talk about. Now, with all that said, it is time to get to Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. If you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. Follow the link down below. Supporting this channel, a number of ways can gain you an entry, and I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the stories that I want to talk about you all from this past week. Our Tuesday video was PS5 games of 2021. Uh, my favorite titles, PS5, 4, and also uh, Series X and Switch, pretty much everything. But, you know, what I've been playing recently, what I'm into, my personal game of the year, go check it out. Uh, coming up, uh, well, Gamescom is over, so... Still not a whole lot going on just yet. Uh, we still have a looming rumor about a potential state of play coming in September, which, you know, that's gonna be right around the corner. So if that ends up happening, I would presume that's uh, probably Sony's last major event, if it's even gonna be a major event. Uh, for this year. Um, so we'll see if that ends up happening. But for now, that's it. That concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Benecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.